So good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the first up-to-date on Toxoplasma retinochoroiditis. I just hope that all of you are keeping safe and healthy. And before moving on to the scientific session, I would request Dr. Vishali, a senior professor from PGI Chandigarh, and also the current president of UVA Society of India to briefly introduce the session. Over to you, Dr. Vishali. Thank you, Manisha. Uh, welcome to all the members who are joining us for this session. The purpose of these up-to-dates is going to be discussing one topic, focusing on the clinical diagnosis and the management aspect with case discussions. So depending on the response and the request from our members, we are going to do different up-to-dates disease-wise. So I'm very happy that we have a great panel and great speakers, Carlos and Andre, whom Manisha is formally going to introduce, and a great panel of Partho, Alev, Dr. Biswas, and of course our youngster joining for case presentations. So without wasting much time, we go ahead with our first speaker that Manisha is going to introduce. Thank you, ma'am. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Carlos Pevesio, who is the Service Director of Medical Retina and Uveitis Services at Moorfields Eye Hospital, London. He's also the editor of Uveitis section of British Journal of Ophthalmology. I'm sure uh, less known to quite a few of us, but he speaks four languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian. So we are quite an admirer of his uveitis work, but this is another asset added to him. So welcome Dr. Carlos and over to you. And he would be speaking to us on the clinical manifestations and diagnosis of Toxoplasma retinochoroiditis. Thank you very much, Manisha. Thank you, Vishali. It's a real pleasure to be uh, with you here uh, today. And uh, uh, as always, you know, it's been a great experience with me being to India before and to uh, share with you some time. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, a lot my time and, and uh, it's really nice to be seeing some of my old friends uh, in these images today. Unfortunately, because of this situation, I think we're only seeing each other on a small screen now rather than being able to get together and, and as we used to. But hopefully this will go away and we'll be back to our normal way. Um, thank you for this invitation. I'll be covering the aspects of the clinical manifestations of um, toxoplasmosis and the diagnosis. So I just want to a short introduction on the, the fact that this parasite uh, is a protozoan that actively penetrates into cells. So it has a very specialized body that makes it uh, able to perforate the membrane of the cell. And once inside the cell, it will form a cyst which is what you see here, which is an intracellular cyst. This is the nucleus of the cell. And inside that cyst, there will be a lot of organisms, which in this stage of the evolution are called bradyzoites because they have a low metabolic rate. The moment that the cyst explodes and the organisms leave the cyst, they become very actively metabolic and they will become tachyzoites. And these are the ones who invade other cells. It, this is a very, uh, famous in terms of a life cycle slide. It shows all the different aspects of how you acquire the disease, keeping in mind that the, the felidae are the, the hosts that have the definitive, uh, the, the sexual cycle of the, the um, organism. So they are the definitive hosts. So they will excrete that in their feces, in the soil, in the right humidity and temperature, that cyst becomes uh, infective and sporulates. And then if ingested by us directly or by other animals, we will create cysts in our bodies and we acquire from the animals that have had before because we eating their meat and if that meat is not well cooked we can then acquire the disease i'll mention in a moment the issue of the importance of water in this because at the time this slide was made water was not really considered as an element of this transmission and now we know it's really a very important component of that this is the reminder of the fetal uh, infection in a vertical transmission, which a, a woman can do during a pregnancy if she acquires the disease during pregnancy. So a woman who is already toxopositive before pregnancy will not transmit to, the, uh, to, the, to her children. 
this is what a transmission of congenital looks like in terms of the appearance, depending on the moment in pregnancy when the disease is transmitted, the, the manifestation will be different. So, and the transmission in the very early stage, which is less common, probably will kill the fetus. If it's in the second trimester, especially towards the end of the second trimester, you're likely to see the scars, these typical macular scars, and of course the presence as well of some cerebral changes. If it's very late in pregnancy, the child may be born completely normal and manifest ch changes related to disease later in life. So these are other examples. Some of these slides are, are courtesy of my friend, uh, Professor Curry, and, and I'll be sharing that with you. He very kindly allowed me to use some of his material. So it shows to you here the presence of the calcifications in the brain and the typical macular scars, uh, which are really uh, diagnostic of this condition uh, congenitally. The issue of the transmission and in postnatal transmission, there's a lot of discussion about that because in Brazil, they found a city where large numbers of people were infected and they, they thought that would be exposure to eating raw or undercooked meat. This is a town called Erechim in the south of Brazil. But it, it couldn't explain the whole picture. So they found that something was missing in that. And it seems that water was what was missing. So this is what Andrea allowed me to use as well. It shows you that in some places, these water storage, storage facilities are very poor quality. The water can be exposed and that exposure allows contamination. It is the contamination of the water that eventually will affect a large number of individuals in the community. This is different from this storage here, which you can see a much better quality in which the water is well protected and this community is unlikely to be exposed to the toxoplasma. When it gets to the eye, then you, you acquire the disease or you get it congenitally and it can affect your eye. And it can have different ways in which you can present in the eye. So I'm gonna go through all these different manifestations as we, we move through the slides. And I'm gonna start here with the anterior segment. One important point to make, you can see the characteristic keratic precipitates, which are granulomatous. And, and my, my uh, mentor in San Francisco, Bob Nozick, used to describe as, as mashed potato splashed against the wall because it's kind of a dirty appearance to the endothelium. Not only the KPs, there are actually a lot of stuff in between them. And one feature that is very important to remember, when the inflammation inside the eye is of low grade, there is a very good chance this individual will have a hypertensive uveitis. If the inflammation is very, very intense, then that they may not happen because the CRD body will reduce its secretion and will balance the trabeculitis and you may end up with a normal level of pressure. But with very little inflammation, you may end up with a high pressure. When you come to the back of the eye, we can have different manifestations. So a primary ocular lesion means there's no previous scar. There's no satellite lesion. This is the first time you're getting this in the eye. And this is what it may look like. So it's very hard to look at that and say categorically it's toxoplasmosis, even though possibly, statistically, the most likely. This is another example here from, from uh, Andre which shows a case in which you can see very clear a lesion, which is already in its healing stage. You can see the boundaries are getting well demarcated, very solid looking. But it's interesting to see here the, the characteristic thickening of the retina, full thickness thickening of the retina in this case. And of course, this patient also developed an epiretinal membrane. This is a case of a primary lesion without a satellite lesion adjacent to that. This is a different story here. Then we have a lesion. You can see on the left, this initial lesion. This is probably 1974. The photograph on the right is 1994, 20 years later. And it shows that the pigmented lesion is the original one you saw on the left, and there's an adjacent lesion to that. So the importance of this is to show that you, you may have a reactivation many, many years down the line. It's not something that happens at specific points in time. These are other examples of the reactivation adjacent to very pigmented scars and, and all the manifestations which can happen surrounding that lesion at the time of this event. These are examples here again. You can see that the vitreous involvement, you can see the vascular changes that may happen and this scar surrounded by this large area of retinitis and a lot of vitreous involvement, similar to the other picture here. So these are all examples of reactivations of toxoplasmosis. We just now, this year, published this paper which is looking at differences between IgM positive and IgM negative cases, which would imply patients who had acquired disease, how, how different they are. And the conclusion showed that the patients who are IgM positive tend to be older. They tend to have more macro lesions. 
and they tend to have less inflammation in the acute stage of the disease. So, the, and this is mainly because the, the immune system was not primed yet to the toxin. So the response is slower and they don't get the same, but down the line, they may still have a gradual inflammatory event. So after six months, they may look more similar. Pain and presentation is also more significant in the patients who have more inflammation. So the IgM negative patients tend to have more pain. This is an example of a reactivation. Again, this is the stuff, this scar is right here. You can see a focus of reactivation. But importantly, even though it's a small lesion with the vitreous looking very clear, you see the amount of subretinal fluid that's accumulated around this lesion. So a serious detachment induced because there is an element of choroidal involvement and there is a decompensation also of the uh, pigment epithelium. Another example here showing a similar pattern in which you have a reactivation adjacent to the optic nerve and the presence of subretinal fluid adjacent to error. This is a, a paper also published uh, this year showing a similar appearance to the one I showed you before. Vascular involvement can happen and it may be just in the form of a plaques on the surface of the arteries, the, the famous Kyrialis plaques or it could be vascular sheathing, which can occur very far away from the original foci, or vascular occlusions. Both veins and arteries can occlude. So this image here shows this large area of retinitis. There is a pigmented scar in the center, but this tongue here, which looks pale, is the ischemic area, which is because of the occlusion of the artery. So vessels can get occluded, but usually when they're crossing over the area of necrotizing retinitis. The vitritis can be intense, and this is one of the things you're gonna mention later on, as one of the complications that patients experience with condensations of the vitreous for which surgery may be required. I wanna show this here, it may not be very easy to see, but sometimes when there is a detachment of the vitreous in front of an area of, as you can see there, if you can use your imagination a bit, you can see little dots. And these represent keratic precipitates, they're wrong name because keratic is corneal, but we tend to use this bad name to describe the deposition of the deposits on the back of the hyaloid. So they're called posterior KPs, which is a bad name, but we all understand what it means. Toxoplasmosis in its typical form is usually one eye, one lesion at a time, self-limited disease. Even if you don't treat, it tends to regress. The atypical forms will breach all these rules. You may have the two eyes affected at the same time, you can have more than one lesion in the same eye, and it may not stop. It may just go on and look like a viral retinitis. So these are some examples. This is slightly from Gary Holland years ago, an HIV patient with a, a retinitis that looked like viral, ended up in toxo. This patient is one of my patients who had a lymphoma, who was in chemotherapy. And these are examples of a neuroretinitis. So not only Bartonella can do that, other infections can, and you can see the focus of retinitis here and the neuroretinitis picture. And this other picture here, which looks more like a viral retinitis, but all these are forms that make the diagnosis a bit difficult. There's some other examples here of uh, patients uh, who develop forms that can be confusing sometimes. Another patient that resembles more of a neuroretinitis down here with a foci far away from the nerve and areas that are a bit larger in their presentation or multiple areas, sometimes in a punctate form, which is one of the potential presentations of this disease. Adge lesions which are adjacent to the nerve can happen. I'll show you more examples of that. These are more likely to be the Jensen's just a papillary retinitis pictures, which in the past were believed to be mostly due to tuberculosis. This is a case that, uh, that uh, shows very well this, uh, this behavior of a toxin that is uncontrolled. This can happen just because you're old or because you're immune suppressed and the diagnosis becomes very challenging. This is one of my patients showing clearly the presence of lesions, more than one lesion in the same eye, and this patient actually had bilateral disease uh, at the same time. So these are the examples of that. This is a lady I saw years ago. You can see there's very intense vitritis in the, the picture that if you look in, you'd say this is probably a viral disease. Uh, and, and she ended up getting a biopsy because we were uncertain of the reason for this. And in the biopsy, we've identified the presence of the toxoplasma cyst. So this was a very old patient who was manifesting this very atypical progressive form of toxoplasmosis. These are other examples here of atypical forms in which you see this very extensive sheathing uh, far away from the original uh, focus. And uh, there are other examples I wanna show you here. This is another example here of a very intense that, that might confuse with something else because you may not believe that that little area of inflammation can result in this much vascular change in the back of the eye. 
in this other kind of uh, ultra punte toxo or, or sometimes called pseudomultiple toxo in which you have many lesions clustered in the same area and these are not related to immunosuppression. This can happen without that, that problem. The peripapillary I mentioned to you before and I think the relevance of this is the proximity to the nerve and the possibility of visual field loss and also the proximity where the vessels come together. So the risk of these patients suffering vascular occlusions that will have a, a bigger repercussion in their uh, visual function. In terms of the healing, when we pay attention to that, we see in the acute phase, there's a lot of swelling, a lot of uh, uh, inflammation going on, and then you have this regression towards the center. And, and that's usually how they disappear. Complications, I mentioned to you the vascular occlusions. You can see the slide at the top here. Again, this one and the possibility of a choroidal new vascular membrane. The, the issue of visual field loss very heavily uh, correlated with the location of the lesion, which is if close to the optic nerve within a diameter of the nerve, more likely to produce significant changes. Um, another potential problem associated with this is sometimes a macro hole can, that can develop. Differential diagnosis will be the possibility of a toxo, you know, that toxoplasmosis you see there, but a viral retinitis, you see many times I'm mentioning that, and syphilitic retinitis can also do that. I think I'm just going to show you this patient here because it's a patient who presented with this uh, swollen disc uh, hemorrhages, appearance of uh, suggestive of a vascular occlusion, but no area suggestive of a retinitis. This patient was put on intensive immunosuppression and returned with a, a very large area of a toxoplasmic retinitis. So this is, from the beginning, it was a toxoplasmic picture, but we missed the, the diagnosis. The patient was immunosuppressed and the disease behaved quite badly. In terms of diagnosis, I just wanna mention that in the di when the clinical diagnosis, the clinical picture is typical, there is no doubt. It's a barn door diagnosis. You can make the diagnosis very easily with a satellite lesion. In acquired cases, it will represent more of a challenge without the scar, but still is something that we will look at the options, how we can achieve the diagnosis. But you can see that the real critical point is when you have atypical cases, because these are going to be individuals who show a presentation falling out of the norm. And for those individuals, probably a combination of serology, which is very limited value, is very valuable when it's negative more than anything, in intraocular antibody analysis or PCR. So the, the obtaining fluid from the eye and checking for antibodies and for antigen will give you, combining the two, the best way of achieving diagnosis. So it's a clinical picture that makes you suspicious, but you can confirm using these techniques, which are uh, available in most places. I want to show you very quickly a case that was put together uh, by Dr. Testi. And essentially, this is a patient we saw in our clinic, Italian origin and uh, had a visual field loss in the right eye and nothing really remarkable about the history. Visual acuity reduced to 612. You saw this image here already in one of the slides I showed you. And when this patient presented, the initial reaction in the clinic was that this was likely to be a viral retinitis. This was a patient that, that came to us and was suspected as a viral retinitis. I wanna show you here, I want, this slide is very interesting because it shows here the separation of the hyaloid and behind the hyaloid, you can see the deposits, which can be seen clinically as these KPs that I was telling you about. But there are inflammatory deposits also on the surface of the retina. So this patient presented in a very active inflammatory state with vitreous cells and, and the involvement of the retina. The laboratory workup was processed because of the suspicion of viral. It started on antiviral therapy, both systemically and locally. The results show that all the viral investigations came back uh, uh, negative, and it was only positive for toxoplasmosis, both in the blood and in the PCR. So the patient had a treatment change, uh, given the adequate medication, and progressed quite well. This is for the final slide to show you here, that once you settle down the inflammation, the inflammatory signs reduce, and the area that was inflamed and suffered the full thickness of the lesion becomes atrophic as a result of the destruction or the necrotizing uh, characteristic of this condition. I think this, this uh, I think covers what I wanted to show you. I'm sure we'll have a chance to discuss this further in, in our uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carl. I think that was an extensive uh, coverage of the entire clinical spectrum of TOXO. Um, I think we'll take up the questions after Dr. Andre's talk. 
So I now invite Dr. Andre Curie, who is the head of the Research Laboratory of Infectious Diseases and Ophthalmology in the National Institute of Infectious Diseases, Ministry of Health, Brazil. And he would be speaking to us on local versus systemic therapy for toxoretinocoroditis and prophylaxis. Over to you, Dr. Andre. Um, good afternoon for you. Uh, thank you very much, Vishali Manisha and the UVIT Society for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's all, always difficult to talk following Carlos uh, because he cover all the, the things and shows nice slides. Uh, one important thing of my CV that I was his fellow 20 years ago. So I'm very happy to be here with him. And I try to cover uh, the idea of treatment and prophylaxis in ocular toxoplasmosis. And there are some challenges in toxoplasmosis and I like to start all my talks in toxo uh, saying this poor uh, question because especially my residents, they don't like to, to see much toxo because 75% of our cases are related to toxoplasmosis retinochoroiditis. So I, I tried to, to, to convince them that it's quite difficult condition because all patients ask these four questions. How did I get the parasite? Will affect the other eye? It will relapse or how we avoid relapses? And the answer is always, I don't know. So it's a quite challenging uh, disease. Uh, regarding treatment, the, the questions are when and how. And there's no consensus about this. There are several studies, and I'll show you uh, most of them. And, and, and you see that, especially when, if you look to the, the, the Brazilian Uveitis Society uh, recommendation, they say that you should treat macular and opner lesions, patients with significant vitreous haze, de decreasing visual acuity uh, over three lines in snell and charts, large areas of retinitis. I, I can say here that I don't agree with this recommendation because I treat all my patients and I will show you how I do this. So this is a, a typical case of congenital. There's a consensus of this that patients present with congenital toxoplasmosis should be treated for one year. So it's quite easy to start therapy in this kind of patient. Uh, patients that have uh, lesions close to the disc, uh, Carlos Pavese showed before, that can live with uh, visual field defects large areas of retinitis. So there's no uh, debate on this also. Uh, this punctate outer retinitis is also a recommendation for treatment. Uh, lesions in posterior pole may be uh, acquired primary lesion like this one in the left or a recurrence, this one in, in the right, but you can see both are very close to the macula. So there's no doubt that you should treat this kind of lesion. Uh, acquired uh, infection like this one, this is a, a patient with the IgM positive with this multifocal uh, presentation. This can happen in acquired toxo and in patients uh, HIV positive, this is a, 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 a patient from Carlos Paveso immunosuppression uh, secondary to lymphoma. So those are cases that are most of the people will treat with antibiotics. The question is, when happened this kind of clinical picture? The reactivation uh, outside the arcades, the vision probably is very good, no vitreous haze. If you should treat this kind of patient or not? I tell you that I, I treat all my patients even with the visual acute is normal, there's no vitreous haze, because usually we don't know the behavior of this clinical picture in the following weeks. So I prefer to give on, on antibiotics and I use most of my patients, I use steroids also. 
Um, very recently in 2018, this colleague from the Northeast of Brazil, Fabio, did a survey uh, in the Brazilian society and said that 70, almost 70% 70 of uh, the, the colleagues treat all cases. So it's a little bit different for the recommendation of the Brazilian society. Uh, if you go to the visual acuity, if less than 20 to 100, almost 90% of the, the colleagues would treat, 94% with severe vitreous inflammation and 88% in the acquired infection. So uh, it's quite common to treat um, Toxo in Brazil. We know that the strain in Brazil is, is more aggressive. So we have a, have a lot of uh, vitreous haze, large areas of, of retinitis and a lot of inflammation. So most of the people are very likely to treat all the um, cases. 50% um, of the colleagues would treat with steroids. I do give steroids to my patient because a great concern is the inflammation in the, in the vitreous. Uh, Carlos Pavedo said that in many cases that you have a haze in the vitreous end up with uh, needing a vitrectomy. And so I use steroids in most of my cases. And the classical therapy is the most uh, preferred uh, treatment. And patients with frequent relapses almost 9% of the colleagues will do prophylaxis. So there are a lot of different treatments. And actually, we know now that there's no difference in clinical picture that if you use pyrimidamine and sulfadiazine, Bactrin, clindamycin, clindamycin with pyrimetamine, azithromycin. Actually, in the end of the story, all works very well. And if you put on steroids together, we will better a uh, chance to uh, protect the, 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 the eye with the vitreous inflammation. Although you can see in, in, in the literature, any clinical trial in the use of oral steroids in ocular toxoplasmosis. You can see here many, many studies that trying to see what is the best option for treatment of Toxoplasmosis retinochoroiditis. So this group of Iran uh, did two studies, one comparing uh, Bactrin and the classical therapy, and the results were uh, the same. And then they tried to do the intravitros compared with the classical therapy, and the results were the same. So actually, uh, you have to see each patient separately to decide uh, whether you do the systemic therapy or the intravitreal therapy. This is an interesting paper that we did in Brazil with the group in the pharmacy uh, regarding adverse reaction in the, the, in the treatment. And 85% had one kind of uh, adverse reaction in the treatment. So it's very high. This is the treatment with uh, the classic therapy. And it's important to say that they're not very bad reaction, but they do exist. So we can consider uh, to avoid uh, systemic reaction to use intraocular therapy. And most of the reactions were due to the steroid use. Uh, regarding prophylaxis, this is a very interesting uh, issue because many years ago, the group from Sao Paulo and the south of Brazil, Prof Professor Silveira, they did a, a trial on using Bactrin for six months and they showed that can be a benefit to use a Bactrin. Later on, they did the follow-up of 10 years uh, study and they didn't show uh, very good results. Uh, recently, Felix from uh, the Northeast of Brazil, he was studying in Sao Paulo. He did a, a, a placebo controlled trial with 141 patients doing a Bactrin uh, as the treatment, original treatment. And then they divided two groups, one giving Bactrin for one year 
in the other group, placebo, and he shows no relapse after three year follow up uh, in the group treating with Bactrin. Very recently, uh, this the same group uh, published the six year um, follow up, and he showed that only 1.4% of the patients uh, that treated with Bactrin for one year following the original and toxoplasmosis retinochoroiditis presented reactivation. So it's very clear now that uh, the prophylaxis is very good, but the question is, which patient we should use the prophylaxis since we have adverse effects of uh, uh, the medication? So I would say that patients that present with very uh, lesions very close to the center of the fovea or very close to the disc or patients with the only eye, I would go for prophylaxis. So if I have this kind of uh, clinical picture, I will offer the patient back train one tablet three times a week for one year. Uh, Regarding uh, reactivation after surgery and prophylaxis before surgery, this uh, issue started when this publication in 2002 come, come up and they showed that uh, patients can present reactivation following cataract extraction. Uh, this is a small number of patients, uh, were only 14 patients that underwent uh, cataract surgery. And if you go to the results in these four patients, in these five patients that present reactivation, three patients present the reactivation more than three months after the surgery. So it's quite difficult to correlate the surgery with the recover, the, the reactivation of the disease. So because of this study, we decided to do another study uh, with Carlos, my colleague in the Minas Gerais, Gustavo Eringer, and the group of Moorfields. And we did a retrospective study with 69 patients, 50 that underwent vitrectomy, 19 with cataract surgery. We had 65 with no relapses, and four patients, the relapses occur between the third to the 17th month, so the month of 4, 13, 14, and 17. So because of this, we decided not to use prophylactic therapy for patients that will need uh, ocular surgery. So just to finish my talk, uh, in this kind of patients as acquired patient bilateral, this can happen. Uh, it's not common, but you can see IgM positive patient with bilateral cases, and once again, I would treat this patient with antibiotics. Once again, Manisha and Vishali, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Andre, and uh, I think uh, we have quite a few questions, so I would not waste any time and take up the questions which have been posted by the attendees. Uh, uh, we have a question uh, which says that why do you think that toxo specifically affects the macula and uh, not so much the peripheral retina? Uh, it's for me or for Carlos? Either of the two. Of them. Okay. It doesn't uh, matter. Actually, actually, anyone? Actually, I, I don't know if Carlos agree, but I, I don't think that. This is really true. We do see a lot of patients with peripheral lesions and probably uh, as the, 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 when the lesion come in the macula, the patient will go to the clinic. So this is important to, to, to think of. This is typical to have uh, in the congenital form in the macula, but even in the congenital, the group of Minas Gerais showed there are several peripheral lesions probably they miss during uh, uh, the, the examination. And they show that 
percent of the case in congenital toxo can present with a scar in the back. So I'm, I'm not sure that this uh, thing that is more common in the macula is really true. I, I agree, know Andrei. You, agree. You, you, I entirely agree. It is what you see. The patients will present when they're more symptomatic. They're going to be more symptomatic if the lesion is involved in the posterior segment, the posterior pole. Peripheral lesions may be unnoticed. So I think it is, it is very much a question of what you see and not really the, the any specific attraction of the toxoplasma towards the macula. The paper I mentioned to you looking at IgM positive and IgM negative looked into that as well just for because we had this data and it did show that the, the patients had a bit more of macular involvement when they were IgM positive comparing to the IgM negatives uh, but I don't think we can explain that just because of this factor. I think uh, clearly the presentation to the clinic will depend on the symptoms and, and posterior pole will show more symptoms it will come more. So it doesn't mean they don't have peripheral lesion. I agree. Uh, regarding this paper, I think we sh you all should read. And we discussed a lot, me and Carlos, uh, uh, before this uh, uh, study was published. And the thing is, at Morpheus, they, they have a bias that patients that go to the clinic, that they are IgM, and they go to the clinic because of a clinical presentation in the eye. At Fiocruz, we have a, a clinic of acquired toxo without any uh, ocular uh, uh, changes. So it's, it's, it's called a, a, a acquired uh, fever clinic. So everybody that have a one week history of, of fever go to this clinic. So we have a huge number of uh, acquired toxoplasmosis, and we don't see the, this. Actually, we find many lesions in the periphery by chance. So the patient go to the, the, the infectious disease clinic, they were sent to us, and we did the, 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 the fundus examination and find some changes in the back. i show you one or two cases like that. So I'm not yeah. very happy with this uh, 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 thing that is, is, is yeah. happening in the macula. I, I, I don't believe. I don't believe. I'm sorry, Carlos, but I, <laughs> no, no, no. I think what, the, the, what you're saying makes sense. I, I, I'm not saying that all the patients IgM will have it. I think well, you're actually right about the fact that I'm reporting only cases who had it. So we're yes. having everybody reported had a problem. So if I look at the screening, probably I'm going to find very few. If I'm looking at a population bias because you're coming due to symptoms, it's a different story. So it is a finding. I, I don't think we can explain why that was that we saw that. And it's retrospective. The numbers of IgM were about only 37 patients. So it's a very small number as well. So it's difficult to draw significant conclusions or draw any, any explanations from that. It's just an observation. And Dr. Carlos, you showed such a, a lot of uh, varied manifestations of toxo. Have you ever come across a vasoproliferative lesion uh, being presented as a cause of, uh, uh, I mean, toxo being a cause of that? I personally haven't. I'm not sure if Andrea may have. He sees a lot more than I do. Uh, I haven't seen a vasoproliferative lesion developing as a consequence of a toxo lesion. Uh, Andrea, you, you, may, you may have seen that. I haven't seen it. No, but I, 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 I believe it's possible. You can uh, present with uh, a closure in, in, in the veins and can cause no vascularization. This is, can, can happen. Uh, and you see, in talk show, it's, it's quite difficult because I remember one case I discussed with Carlos another day um, with uh, hypopion. This is quite unusual too. And, and people ask me, Oh, can happen hypopion with toxo? And I said, yes, I saw one case that I, I doubt it. And the, the, the guy said, uh, Andrea, come here to see this patient. I think it's toxo. There's a hypopion. I said, no, no. With hypopion, it's not toxo. Probably virus or basher disease or other, other thing, but, but not toxo. And then you see this classical scar with the satellite lesion. So I, I think can happen. Mm -hmm. But, but they are not diagnostic of toxic. No. 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 Dr. Uh, Andrew? Yes. Andrew, 
so okay. is it in congenital toxoplasmosis we are discussing about this so uh, this uh, macular scar can it be due to that the transmission occurred through the hematogenous root and maybe the because of the end artery anatomy of the fetal macular circulation is there any role what do you think i think this is an explanation that that uh, is used to explain a lot of macular you know lesions if if you look at onchocerciasis mm -hmm. a lot of posterior pole lesions in onchocerciasis and maybe it's coming because of the the penetration is easier that the vessels are there a lot of the small ciliary uh, arteries in exactly that location um so make it easier to get there um, it's difficult to know. Clearly, the, the congenital ones, the classic congenital ones, is very large macular scars, um, are, are hallmark. But as Andrea was saying, you can get potentially, if you look at kids with uh, congenital, they will also have other lesions, not only limited to the macula. That is the one that, that's very obviously seen. Uh, and the one important thing to mention about the, the toxo in children congenital, you look at those eyes, they have these very large scars and the vitreous is clean. You don't really see signs of a of a huge inflammatory event in the eye because it happened in a stage in development when the immune system is actually not doing a great deal. So what you see is a very destructive feature, but not a lot of inflammation. So these kids are born with scars, but the vitreous itself looks at you. The examination of the eye is very easy at that stage. Of course, they can reactivate later on and that can change. But in that fetal stage, the reaction in the eye inflammatory basically don't exist. Yeah. I can have a quick comment from all the panelists. There are basically two questions related to the serology. So if you see a patient whose IgM is positive, would you prefer to treat that patient with a systemic therapy over a local therapy? What is the take of all the panelists on this? I personally don't use that to determine how I treat the patient. I'll treat the patient is a clinical picture that, that tells me what I'm going to do, is the medical condition of the patient, uh, the patient doesn't tolerate ther therapy. So most of the times we go for systemic therapy. Uh, and giving injections, of course, is invasive. Uh, there's inconvenience of the patient having to come back on a weekly basis because they may need injections sequentially. You have to determine that. Uh, some patients need five, six injections. Some others will need less, variable. Um, so we tend to use more systemic therapy in general terms. Uh, but I, I don't use the IgG, IgM status as, as the way to determine. Of course, if you get someone systemically affected by acute toxo, an IgM positive, they may need treatment for other reasons beyond the eye problem. That's different. But if you're asking me the IgM, IgG status and the eye problem, I don't look at that as a factor to determine what I do. I'm sure, Andrea, I'm not sure if you think differently from that. No, I, I completely agree. I, I think probably the most important thing is where is the lesion? And if you are very uh, um, certain that the diagnosis is toxo, really toxo. Uh, one thing that I can mention about treatment, if you have a, a lesion that we are not very happy to make the diagnosis of toxo, you don't know if it's viral, toxo, and you order the lab tests. What I do because of the frequency in Brazil, I do Bactrin without steroids, waiting for the results. So I can cover toxo that's much more common than a, a viral to wait the lab test to come. If they come IgG positive, doesn't help because 80% uh, of the population is, is, is positive. In Brazil, but it becomes negative. It helps me to think of another condition like virus. And doing Bactrin is okay. You can protect toxo. We treat toxo if it is. So it's another important thing about the uh, trying to decide between uh, systemic or intra vitro. Most of the cases I go for systemic therapy. And Dr. Biswas. Andre, you give dexamethasone with the intravitreal clindamycin routinely? Dexamethasone, yes, yes, dexamethasone, yes. It's important to, to point that you can use triancinolone. Yeah. They tried when it was a disaster. They did a trial in Brazil with two groups, one with dexamethasone, one with uh, triancinolone, and then they with the transcendental group because it was a disaster. So when you do intravitreous, it has to be with dexamethasone or alone. So I Dr. Guess, since uh, you mentioned it, uh, like, you know, uh, 
differentiating it from a viral etiology, do you think an OCT is going to have any role? We have a question from Dr. Shahana, yeah. where she says that if you have a choroidal involvement on OCT, would you err on the side of patoxo in such a situation? Yeah, that, that's a good point. This, is what, this was presented very elegantly by, by Alessandro Invernizzi uh, during one of our meetings last year. I think it was in Taiwan he presented that. And it showed very well that if you have doubts and you do an OCT exactly over where the lesion is, if the choroid is uninvolved, this is likely, most likely, to be the viral retinitis. If you look at the choroid and the choroid is thickened and abnormal, then this is very likely to be a retinal choroiditis, then toxo. So the OCT, when you can do it uh, over the areas, is helpful. The problem is some of these patients may have vitritis that makes it very difficult for you to be able to make that decision looking at the image. But if the image is of good quality, that would be a way of trying to separate them clinically or, or imaging wise. Yeah. Carlos, Dr. I've got, <coughs> Carlos, I've got a question. Uh, in case of granulomatous uveitis, do you routinely do the toxoserology, granulomatous uveitis? Um, no, but you mean with the anterior segment granulomatous? Yes. But without posterior or with posterior involvement, with the vitreous haze. Vitreous haze. Well, I, I think if, if the, the point here for me, I will think of talk. So if I can see a retinitis, and that certainly in the middle of a very very hazy vitreous, I may only see a yellowish lesion or or the headlight in the fog, that that will make it possible to be toxo. So if you have a, a doubt, the problem with the serology, as I mentioned before, it, it can come back positive. It doesn't explain what's happening in the eye. It's more valuable if you have a negative serology because it makes it less likely. Someone who's never been exposed to toxo is unlikely to have toxo in the eye, but a positive serology doesn't make the diagnosis. So in those patients with vitreous haze and you have the your, your difficulty, then probably, if you have doubts, is taking a sample from the eye is the best way of making the diagnosis. Yeah. There is another question. When will you take the sample? And uh, what should be the duration of Bectrim DS? And would you add clindamycin to hasten the recovery? All the panelists, please free free. Yeah. So I, I just didn't get that question very well, Vishali. So if I have, can you, I missed a bit of what you said. One question is related to treatment. What should be the duration of Bactrim DS? Bactrim. So Andrea, you, you the, the guy who uses Bactrim. The duration? Uh, uh, a month. All a of month. my patients is a month. I use and six weeks to eight weeks. And would you add another drug like clindamycin to make no, it? No, if I use Bactrin, I use Bactrin alone. If I use clindamycin, I use it alone. And the classical therapy, I use the, the, the whole uh, uh, lot, the, the uh, pyrimetamine, sulfadiazine, folinic acid, and plus steroids. I do use steroids in all, I can say that almost my all cases, I, I, I use steroids. It's important to treat the vitreous. Uh, the vitreous is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a bad guy in, in, in is the bad guy in, in, in talk show. It's much more common to have a visual impairment because of the vitreous rather than the lesion itself. So many times you have a, a lesion in, in the, the periphery, but create a lot of vitreous traction. You can have uh, detachment, you can have macular hole, uh, ep retinal membrane is quite common to have. It's not easy to remove this uh, ep retinal membrane. But the vitreous haze is easy, so it can go for a vitrectomy. So I, I do use steroids in all my patients with the antibiotics. Do you combine local with systemic therapy? Quite a few people want to know that. No, I never did. I never do did. Do give local or systemic? Yeah. If I, if, I, if I think that I need a local, I forget the, 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 the systemic and go for local. I, 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 there's no point in, do, I, I can see the point in doing both. If you feel that the systemic therapy is not enough, so you go for, for local therapy. Oh, I lay in part with Dr. Biswas. Do you combine local with systemic? 
No, I, I think he, oh, sorry, who who is who's I thought it was from me. Sorry, I, I stepped in. So Carlos, Ale, well, well, very quickly then Ali can say that as well. But I, I, I agree with Andre. Um, uh, combining the studies have compared both. Look, they're equal. They're very similar in what they do. So there's no advantage in combining them. I think one, if not working, or there's a contraindication, or the patient cannot tolerate, which happens. You know, Andre showed a large number of patients having side effects from the drugs they take. And sometimes these patients cannot tolerate the therapy very well. So then you have a reason to switch. But I don't think there is a reason to add. It's uncommon that that won't work. Uh, and, and I agree with Andrea. For me, the most important aspect of treatment is to give the steroid. If you give just the antitoxal drug to the patient, it actually may make no difference to the natural history of the lesion. It may progress just in the same way. It will make a difference if the patient is immunosuppressed. That's a different story. But if the patient is not immunosuppressed, using just the antitoxal drug is not going to change the course of that event. What really protects the eye from damage is the steroid. And I use it at the same time. I don't give a loading dose of Toxo before I start the steroid. They start together on the same day. Yes, I, I also agree, uh, Andre. I think uh, in most uh, patients, when we choose to use local therapy, it's basically where the systemic therapy is contraindicated. So yes. then it's, there's no point in giving an additional systemic therapy in these patients. And I almost always use uh, dexamethasone along with uh, the clindamycin in my local therapies. Yeah, I agree. In okay. terms of systemic therapy, Vishali, one thing that we do a lot is use azithromycin here in, the, in London. And azithromycin is a drug that seems to work well. It, it's a drug that we use for mainly lesions which are not macular. If they are macular lesions, we tend to be azithromycin plus pyrimethamine. I think azithromycin has two big advantages over sulfadiazine. It's less likely to cause a, 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 a allergic reaction. And second, it's easier to take. It's once a day against four times a day. So it's, it's an easier drug to prescribe. But there are reports of uh, cases not responding well to azithromycin monotherapy. So it's not a good idea to give for macular lesions because you may allow the lesion to progress, especially if you're using the steroids, as we said we do. So in those lesions, I prefer to give the combination of pyrimethamine with azithromycin. For peripheral lesions, I can go with azithromycin and observe. If I'm not happy, I can add, but in my peripheral lesions, it seems to be less important. Uh, I have a question, Carlo. If you, yeah. if you had a macular lesion, and for Andrew as well, uh, do you think giving an intravitreal therapy primarily, uh, and then later on, you know, adding the systemic therapy maybe uh, one or two weeks down the line would uh, help us to salvage the macula faster than the systemic therapy? I, I don't think we have any evidence of that for sure. We haven't done that. But thinking about the way the disease works, I wouldn't think it will make a difference to, to that sequence of events. I think in situations when, like we, we talk about, someone presents with a batches event and there's an inflammatory batches lesion in the macula. So giving an intravitreal steroid at the time of presentation may be very helpful. Then you go into systemic treatment. In the case of, uh, of uh, Toxo, I, I don't think I know the answer in terms of I've done studies and I can tell you that for sure. But thinking about that, I think it would be less likely to be a, a, a real important aspect of that. As I said before, the most important element is the steroid. It's not so much the, 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 the drug you're treating the Toxo. Um, so, if, and the concern about the steroid in the eye would be, you know, if you have to cover with something and then the dexamethasone is short-lived. Yes. So maybe, maybe in some patients might be an alternative. I'm not sure, Andre, he sees a lot more toxin than I do. He, he may do things in a different way. So he yeah. may have done that. But I, I haven't tried that. The idea is, is, is good. It's reasonable to do this. If you have a, a macular lesion and theoretically you will protect the macula. We used to do this in CMV retinitis. Yeah. The yes. zone so one disease, yeah. lesion, yeah. you go for an implant or uh, uh, intravitreous uh, goncyclovir. But what, what was this striking is, is, is a question I would, I would like to, 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 to do this question to you all. All the studies uh, that compared the treatment showed that there's no difference. Okay, we, we agree with this. Yes. Uh, why? Why we prefer to use the classical therapy when it's macular, the lesion is macular? 
if all the drugs are the same, so why don't you use the same drug for all cases? Yeah. Uh, no. uh, this is yeah. uh, the only explanation that I see is the in vitro, uh, uh, um, the way that the, 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 the classic therapy uh, works in vitro, not in animal or, 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 or in vivo. So because of this, we tend to use the classical therapy. But, but it's a question. Yeah. What do you think? I, I think you, you make a good point. What I mentioned before about the azithromycin, my only concern is azithromycin alone. We know that it may not work for all cases. So my worry is that I have a macro lesion and I give azithromycin only. I may not be covering that individual enough. So in macro lesions which are threatening, I will use azithromycin in combination. But the point you make about why, why do I change my approach? Because if there's no difference, why do I have to change? So I, I could use the same thing all the time. Uh, and, and, and you could say I could use intravitreal all the time. Yes, you could. The, the results show they are the same. The, the results are the same. So you could very well do that. Uh, it, it's more because I think it's an invasive procedure. You're putting a needle in the eye. You may have to do it more than once. You will have to do it more than once. You cannot treat with one injection only. So you are exposing the patient to some extra risks. Uh, they are small. Agree, we, we're so used to injecting these days that we know the risks are small, uh, but nevertheless, it's, an, uh, it's an, uh, an added risk of something happening. On the other hand, you may argue, well, but you're running risks giving them tablets as well because they may have all the side effects on the drug. So it's a bit of a, a balance there. So I think it's a good question. I don't think we have an answer in, in whatever. The, the point I make in my lectures about talks so when I talk about treatment, I just tell people, do whatever you prefer. I'm not going to tell you to do what I do because whatever you do may be right. And there's no right or wrong here. I think the combination people use, the different approaches, they probably work all about the same. So I don't impose my thought. I just feel whatever you think works, use it. My point is, uh, I treat with the classical therapy, most of the cases. And in Brazil, people love Bactrin. People love because it's easier, it's cheap. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite uh, easy for the patient to handle with the Bactrin. It's only two yeah. tablets a day. But when you ask them, oh, if it, the lesion is macular, no, no, in this case, I'll change for the, the classic. So, yeah, I understand. So they, they do what they don't believe. They believe that's the same, but yeah. if the, the, the lesion is more threatening, they, they use another drug. So, yeah. I agree there's with no you. I, yeah, there's no I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah I, think, I, think, I, I think it depends from uh, case to cases. Like we also combined uh, local therapy with uh, systemic therapy. The cl intravitreal clindamycin is an excellent drug. Only problem is the half-life. It has a half-life of one week. So you need multiple injections. So sometimes we, we give intravitreal injection when the patient is on systemic, uh, systemic drug and not showing response. In that case, we may, we may add uh, intravitreal injection. I think yeah. Ali's idea, the, the question he raised before, about using uh, injection like we're doing in, in yes. viral retinitis. We always give a false carnet on presentation. Uh -huh. uh, when patient, uh, so yeah. the idea of giving a clinamycin and a dexamethasone and then going for systemic after that may be an interesting approach. I have never tried that. Okay. No, I, I've never tried, but it makes sense. I think it's a reasonable thing to suggest and, and uh, maybe something to consider. You know, someone comes with a macro lesion, will it make a difference? But sometimes it's any micro that you micron that you come re to recover is significant okay. because in that location anything is significant so any improvement you can get extra is valid i think your question Anna, is perfectly you know great a great i great should suggestion try. yeah we should try yeah. right. well, i have another question that how frequently would you like to repeat the intravitreal injection i mean is there an upper limit to that I think on the basis of what you, we, we already heard, and that's what I do anyway, I tend to give weekly injections, depending on the behavior clinically as well. But the half-life will allow you a cover for about a week, and then you have to repeat that injection. So we tend to give, if you look at what Andrea was replying before, how long do you treat for? Maybe four weeks, maybe six weeks. Some patients may need four injections weekly. Some patients go on to have more than four, because it depends on what's happening to the lesion in the eye as well. So if I see there's still inflammation, the lesion still not responding, I will carry on injecting. So the number of injections will be dictated by the clinical picture. Uh, but I think the gap normally that I give is weekly. 
with viral diseases, many times I do two weekly injections as an induction, and then I go to weekly after that. But with Toxo, I haven't really done that. I've done just weekly injections. I'm not sure the others can tell me your experience. You know, it's great to hear everybody else saying what they think. Yeah, Ale, you want to add something to it? No, I think I think weekly is fine. But I don't know. Uh, in my experience, uh, luckily for most of my patients, I have never had to use more than three injections. So maybe it's it's a different yeah. geography. Uh, say, if you read the literature, it shows yeah. that uh, the, the the papers published on this show that most of the patients will get away with about three injections in average, but there are patients receiving five or six right. depending right. on the clinical presentation. So I, it's a case by case that you define. Uh, there is one interesting question from Dr. Kumara Sami. She says, uh, are he, uh, they, he has a patient of, uh, from Colombia, severe vitreous inflammation, but no focal patch of retinitis. IgG is positive, PPD is positive, and uh, no tap was done. X-ray was no TB. So should they uh, make the diagnosis of Toxo just with IgG positive and vitreitis and no retinitis? <laughs> Andrea, you can, you, I can see you shaking your head already. Yeah. In Brazil, I, 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 I want. I won't give this diagnosis without seeing a retinitis because of the IgG only. I have 80% is positive in Brazil. So you can, you can make the diagnosis. I, I think it's the same for you in India with the PPG of I six have, millimeters. I diagnostic with retinitis in such cases when yeah. you don't know what you are dealing with. Yeah. yeah. And, as I mentioned before, for like biopsy and PCR. Yeah. We, if we I had the diagnosis, I would treat with back train alone and see the behavior. That was another question for you from somebody that you have given it for four weeks and the lesion is partially responded. Would you stop it? Because you said you will give it for four weeks. No, I, 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 I do for four weeks. All my patients I treat for four weeks. Now, at four weeks, the lesion is not completely healed. What ah, all have? right. So I, I keep to six. I'll mm -hmm. keep the, the to six. What is important too is sometimes the lesion is completely healed. The, 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 the periphery of the lesion is healed. The center showing some different feature, but the lesion is healed. But the vitreous is still dirty, a lot of opacities. You don't have to treat this. And there's no point in trying to give steroids to, to, to clear the vitreous. You have to wait. This is very common. You do see a lot of patients that we treat for four or six weeks, and then the vitreous continue to stay uh, 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 dirty. And we follow these patients every month, and then the vitreous coming clear and clear and cleaning, cleaning, and then the, 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 the visual acute improves. So I think it's important to wait to three to six months to go for a surgery to clear the vitreous. I don't know I if you one, do. I have one comment here, Vishali. Uh, and uh, um, sometimes, and that this some, that we may disagree a bit with Andrea here, but sometimes I see patients who have gone through the treatment, they heal and they look better then you stop the steroids and they come back two weeks later saying they're seeing more floaters in the mm -hmm. eye. And that happens usually in large lesions, not in the small lesions. If they had a very large lesion, they, they get better. They, they, you see, that's fine, you're off. And then they come back and say, I think my toxo had reactivated. Then you look in their eyes and the toxo has not reactivated. It just scars. But the vitreous is definitely worse than it was at the time they were discharged. So they are doing it kind of an immune recovery picture in the sense of I remove the steroids and there is antigen in that vitreous and the body's reacting to that antigen. So the patient does get a bit more of inflammation. In this patients, depending on what I see, depending on how much, I do give them a bit of steroids. I do give them to see to bring it down. I don't necessarily put them back on the antitoxin treatment, but I give them a course of steroids, low dose, just enough to switch off that process because they are very bothered. They, they were okay, and then they come back and say, this is all back again. So if you give them the steroids, it tends to get better. And the, the lesson I've learned over the years, in these individuals, I taper the steroid a lot slower 
than I would do with the other patients because I know there's probably a lot of antigen in that eye. So I'm just allowing more time for that to clear. So eventually they'll come off. If there's gonna be some vitreous left over, as Andreas said, you may have to wait several months to make your final decision. And many times that clears significantly to the point of not needing any surgery. So very few patients actually go on to have surgery. The majority of patients end up uh, you know, feeling either because it goes down or because it's so little that they don't get bothered enough to justify an operation. Can I, can I come in? Yeah. Uh, I have had the opportunity to uh, you know, use the topical diflupredinate eye drops along with the prophylactic anti-glaucoma drops in such patients. And I think the diflupredinate has a very good posterior segment penetration. And it really clears off this remaining, you know, mild vitreous haze, which patient yeah. is complaining about the floaters. So uh, in majority of my patients now, I don't need to put them on systemic steroids. I just give them topical just twice a day. That's it. And, yeah. you know, maybe for two weeks and then taper it to once another for two weeks. And most of them do pretty well. Yeah, we, we don't have Durazol in the UK. Right. So without that, I, I know Durazol has a very, very striking reputation for being good for posterior disease as well. Yeah. But we have no access to that. So I, I'm unable to offer that to my patients. So I, I'm limited to more conventional therapies. Uh, right. But I, I hear that from other people as well, that yes, you can get a good effect. But I, I unfortunately cannot prescribe that. I don't have it. It would be interesting if you have enough patients to do two groups, Meal. one with doing nothing and the other one Durazol and see what happens in a six months follow-up. It would be very nice, very nice. Uh, I'll just interrupt the discussion. We've all, already overshot the time, so maybe we can take up a few more questions at the end, if the time permits. And we'll move on to the case presentations now. We have three cases in line. Uh, the first one being from Dr. Anu and he's from LBPI Bhuvaneshwar. Uh, of course, we already are joined in by Dr. Biswas, Dr. Ale, and Dr. Partho, who are going to be discussing the cases along with Dr. Carlos and Dr. Andre. So please feel free to you know, join into the discussion at the end of the case presentation. Dr. Anup, you can share your screen, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Manisha. Uh, so I'll start with uh, uh, unusual presentation of uh, Doxoplasma retinopyelitis. Uh, to stay with the narrative, today I want to present the presenting features first, followed by the past history. So without further ado, we will go to the case. Uh, this was a 15-year-old lady uh, presented to us with a diminution of vision since one month. Her right eye was uh, good, 20-20 and 6 of vision. Anterior segment was quiet and fundus was uh, visible and within normal limit. However, in the left eye, she had 2200 vision and 36 for the near. And when we saw the anterior segment on slit lamp, she had fresh uh, granulomatous inferior KPs with AC cell 3 plus. Uh, seeing the posterior pole, she had a uh, unifocal uh, necrotizing retinitis at macula. There was, a, there was a vitreous haze and OCT showed a full thickness retinitis with uh, considerable back shadowing and uh, pre-retinal hyperreflective clumps were seen. So we went forward with the diagnosis of uh, right eye emetropia and left eye granulomatous entry uveitis with unifocal necrotizing retinochoroiditis and given the clinical picture, uh, it's a toxoplasma retinochoroiditis. So we probed this girl for history and she gave a, a sorry here. So on the nasal part of the fundus, she had this multiple yellowish white stuck on lesions giving a chirilis vasculitis like appearance. Now these aren't crystalline and these aren't on artery and these are also seen elsewhere over the surface of the retina. Also this case had uh, vascular sheathing around the veins. So coming to the past history, uh, when we dwelled into her history, she told the history of uh, diminution of vision three months back uh, when her vision recorded elsewhere was 2200. Uh, this was a photograph that was available to us where we could see a uh, disc edema with nasal margin blur, uh, peripapillary vascular sheathing, which was at the macula as well. Uh, so this was the dilemma that uh, landed into our mind that what if this case presented to us first and could 
we have diagnosed this as toxoplasma retinocarditis or toxoplasma papillitis for that matter. Uh, seeing in retrospective, probably the place where we got the retinitis at our presentation, there was a yellowish lesion, uh, deep mm -hmm. retinal. Maybe what we would have done here is got an OCT and then observed it. However, uh, the treating ophthalmologist thought this to be a case of uh, papillitis and in view of her young age, he got uh, MRI brain done, which was normal. And he, she was much treated on the lines of ONTT trial with IV methyl prednisolone followed by a short course of uh, Vicelone. So uh, her vision improved to around 2125. And again, she had a loss of vision for which she came to us. So going to the treatment part, uh, in this particular case, uh, since it was a macular involvement, uh, we are sticking to this uh, regime, which was a combination regime of clindamycin along with uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, that's the Bactrim DS. Uh, generally, we tend to give uh, Bactrim DS for six weeks, and we stop the tapering steroid two weeks prior to uh, Bactrim DS. So this was the treatment that we started her with. However, after one week, when we had injected clindamycin and started on Bactrim DS with uh, Vicelone 50 mg, which was 1 mg per kg according to her dose, there was resolution of the preretinal stuck-on lesions that we saw earlier at presentation. However, inferiorly, she had uh, what we call as posterior subhalate precipitates or uh, posterior KPs, as Dr. Carlos had mentioned. But at this particular point, we were uh, sort of unaware of the scenario when we get this inferior, uh, uh, inferior partial PVD with heme and uh, this nodular preretinal lesions. So we thought a possibility of flare-up of inflammation versus a alternative diagnosis like syphilis in which uh, preretinal precipitates are known. So we got her serology for which, which was uh, toxo IgG positive. IgM was negative and both the tests for syphilis, uh, TPHA and VDRL were non-reactive. When we went into the uh, literature, we got to know that this has have been described already as posterior KPs by Richard O'Connor. And uh, these KPs uh, we think were, were uh, these are said to be the inflammatory aggregates gravitating inferiorly. Uh, the main material, inflammatory material that is derived on uh, could be those stuck on lesions that we saw on the vessels and surface of the retina and the preretinal clumps that were evident on the OCT. So these uh, PSPs or the posterior KPs resolved after two weeks and the retinitis lesion had a good dealing with uh, pigmented scar during a follow-up period of six months. So thank you. Uh, these are my two questions for uh, panelists today. Uh, how to diagnose a case of atypical presentation of toxoplasmosis if it presents as papillitis alone uh, without a focal retinocarditis? And uh, second is uh, posterior KPs, as Dr. Carlos has already mentioned, what their significance and the pattern of resolution that you see uh, in your practice. Thank you. It was great, great presentation, great case. Um, I, I presented in my talk a, a case that was not exactly the same, but similar. The, the lady who's got steroids because she came with a swollen disc and developed toxo after the steroids were given. So very similar to your case. Um, I, I think in your patient, uh, there was a clue there in that, that image that there was a retinitis going on uh, that, that could have been seen at that stage. And, and we just talked about the fact that even though toxo is a localized uh, um, infectious process, inflammatory reactions can happen away from it. So that optic nerve swelling and all that was secondary to that event already happening. The difficulty is if you see nothing at all, if, if, if there's no clue of retinitis, just a swollen disc, it's a bit complicated because toxo affecting the nerve directly is possible. There are pathology specimens showing the presence of the toxoplasma within the nerve. But in our clinical experience that day to day, the patients we see having a very swollen disc with a pure appearance of inflammation are usually associated with an adjacent retinitis. Uh, and, and many times, you know, once the whole thing settles down, you can even see there was already a small scar there hidden by the inflammation that you didn't see during the acute phase. So it could be just a recurrence adjacent there. So it may be hard in some patients if there's no clue. If you don't see a retinitis, if you just see a, a papillitis truly, um, it's, hard, it's very hard to say this would be toxic. Um, in your patient, as I mentioned, there was a clue. 
in many patients, if you look carefully, you will find there's something around the nerve that explains what was going on. In terms of your question regarding the, the, the hyaloid deposits and all that, I don't think they have a specific significance. They are just, you, you, you can see the images that you create, the hyaloid detaches from the retina. It creates like similar to the anterior chamber, isn't it? You have the hyaloid would be the back of the cornea and, and you have fluid in there. So inflammation going on and deposits will, will go either way on the surface of the retina or the back of the hyaloid. I don't think there's specific, I, I don't know of a specific significance of that finding in terms of uh, telling you what to change or what you're going to do anyway. I think that the moment the inflammation starts to respond and you showed very, very nicely in your case, your treatment immediately had an effect on the arterial deposits on the veins. So the inflammation subsiding, those changes will subside too. They will gradually fade away. I don't think there's a specific meaning, uh, but you know, I'm handing over to someone who knows more than me, Andrea or, uh, you know, or, or the other colleagues online might, might give you a different take on that. Mark, do you have any Yeah, I know yeah. a very, very interesting case actually. So uh, if you uh, look, you know, this uh, 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 toxoplasmosis uh, related optic neuropathy, there was a paper I, from US, I think. So they divided this optic nerve involvement into two types. So type one, they leveled it as a secondary infectious involvement of the disc, optic disc from an adjacent focus of the retinochoroiditis. And the type two, they leveled it as a primary isolated involvement of the optic disc where there is no evidence of retinochoroiditis. So your case actually represents nicely the both the variety, both the combination. Initially, it presented as a type two, then it presented with the retinochoroiditis. But if you look carefully in your first picture, though, which was, uh, I, I, I believe it was sent to you by the treating doctor, you can see the vascular, I, some chiralis plaque-like correlations are also there. The perivascular uh, the optic disc, uh, if you see carefully. So I think that there, there was a clue. And as Dr. Uh, Carlos highlighted, yeah, sometimes it can be difficult because if it is a primary isolated involvement without any evidence of retinochoroiditis, then it can be challenging. The next important point with optic nerve involvement is, is often we see the vitreatis is very less in such patients. If there is no retinochoroiditis, the, it becomes much difficult for us to consider a diagnosis. So only thing you have to follow up these cases regularly and look for the associated sign. Um, I would like to, to raise another point. Uh, it's really difficult to, 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 to see this kind of primary uh, op nerve involvement. And as Carlos and Patu said that there's a, a clue. There's another point. Uh, there's an anterior chamber, anterior chamber inflammation that you showed. So it's quite difficult to believe in a, a, a real neuritis with this uh, uh, precipitates and the cells. So it's important to know if that presentation three months before, if they already had this anterior chamber involvement. Uh, because then she did not have she did not have anterior chamber reaction. No. Like no. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I, I agree, but to have to follow this patient very close uh, rather than giving uh, um, a two prednisolone. alone. Uh, regarding the, 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 the hyaloid uh, precipitates, we do see in focal retinitis, other cause of focal retinitis, not uh, 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 only toxo. You can see in viro, you can see in syphilis. So it's not not specific. Oh, it's not specific. Yeah. There's one, one point here, Andre. You, you said something there that, that I want to put back to the group for discussion. If you see the optic nerve thing you just, we just heard, you say you need to observe and not to treat with steroids because we don't know what it is. But if you have an optic nerve involvement with significant reduction in vision, you get really pressed to do something. You can't just observe this individual in progressing with visual loss. So that's when I, I, I really not, I have not seen probably in my experience a case of a primary optic nerve involvement in toxo without an adjacent lesion. So I would feel really in trouble if someone comes to me with an optic nerve involvement without retinal disease to call that toxo. Probably I would be treating the optic nerve inflammation with steroids because I want to preserve the nerve as long as I'm happy there's nothing else. And then I would probably fall into the trap of getting the deterioration 
because I'm immunosuppressing. So I'm not sure how to get out of this situation easily because if there's no clue of the toxo, you just the optic nerve, what, how do we go about that? No, I agree, but you, you need... To examine the periphery in detail with scleral depression and all so that you're not missing, say, a patch of retinitis which could be viral in the periphery. Well, but it, no, I'm just... I'm just talking about a primary optic nerve problem without any lesions, okay? If you have a retinitis in the periphery, you can get a swollen disc. Yeah, but I'm just putting okay. that rule that out very thoroughly. Yeah. But sometimes yeah, they talking. present with... Sometimes they can present with chiralis, chiralis arteritis. The yeah, swollen should, optic disc with yeah. chiralis arteritis should arrest the suspicion of that. Manisha, uh, um, my, Dr. My, 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 you are muted. You are muted. Oh, no. I have a follow-up question for Dr. Carey. sampling in such a situation where you really don't know what's the cause of the optic nerve involvement before starting steroids? Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the presence of an optic neuritis with poor vision, uh, you, you have to do your best to identify a potential cause of that. But you know that you, the only way you're going to really retrieve that nerve is if you're going to give this patient steroids. But your concern is, do I have to cover with something else? This is unlikely to be, you now the myelination, you're talking about a papillitis and, and more with the presence of inflammation in the eye. So the steroids will make a difference to this individual, but your concern is, is understanding the mechanism for that papillitis. So excluding an infection is the key, as we all know, um, but not always that simple in, in the absence of any other clues. In children, it's easier because most children have a papillitis which is predominantly viral, not a viral in the sense of a, a herpetic viral bad disease that we'll get, and they get better spontaneously. A lot of them recover very well. But when you have an adult presenting with that, it's a bit more challenging. Right. So, Matisha, should we move on? Yeah, let's move on to the next case presentation by Dr. Nivedita. She's doing her fellowship under Dr. Biswas at Shankar Netrale. Hi, good day to all. I'm Dr. Nivedrita, a fellow in Shankar Netrale. I'll be presenting a case of a 57-year-old lady who presented with sudden painless defective vision in the right eye since two weeks. She did not reveal any significant past illness. The patient was diagnosed as viral retinitis by a local ophthalmologist and was started on uh, oral valacyclovir uh, one gram three times a day oral prednisolone 60 mg along with topical steroids and cycloplegic since one week. Since she was not improving, she was referred for further management. On examination, the best corrected visual equity in right eye was 6 by 60. Anterior chamber 1 plus cells and flare was noted. Anterior vitreous face showed uh, 2 plus vitreous cells. Intraocular pressure was normal and left eye was within normal limits. In, on fundus evaluation of the right eye, there was minimal vitreous haze, significant disc edema was noted, and the most striking feature was a large uh, diffuse retinitis patch, uh, which was multifocal and confluent in the nasal half and uh, multifocal in the temporal quadrant with superficial hemorrhages and adjacent retinal vasculitis. The previous lab investigation showed a normal blood routine, serum angiotensin converting enzyme, MAN2, chest X-ray, and virology uh, from the serum for HSV, CMV, and VZV was normal. A presumptive diagnosis of diffuse necrotizing retinitis, possibly due to viral etiology, was considered. Uh, so the sequence of event after presentation to us on day one, uh, we obtained uh, a anterior chamber tap and aqueous humor was subjected to a polymerized chain reaction for HSV1, 2, VZV and CMV. And since she was not responding to oral antivirals for one week, we switched to intravenous acyclovir 500 mg three times a day and oral steroids was continued. On day two, uh, the AC tap reports came and it was all negative for the viruses. Day three, we were disappointed the lesion size was increasing and uh, with 10 days of antiviral, seven days of oral and uh, three days of parenteral and uh, antiviral, there was no response. So we had to rethink our diagnosis. 
the differential diagnosis at this point which we considered was viral retinitis syphilis and uh, toxoplasma retinochoroiditis viral we ruled out uh, based on the negative acetab and no response to antivirals we ordered serum melisa hiv 1 and 2 uh, vdrl rpr and tpha and serum uh, toxo igg and igm so as soon as hiv was ordered the patient came up with the following history cerebral hemorrhage 20 years back for which multiple blood transfusions transfusions were done uh, history of pyrexia of unknown origin 2 years back when the treating physician had suspected hiv and when asked why these history were not revealed she thought it was not relevant for her eye problem meanwhile uh, the next day we got the blood report serum elisa hiv1 was positive and serum toxoplasma igg and igm was positive we also asked for the acetab uh, nested pcr for toxoplasma b1 gene uh, and uh, that also came as positive so a diagnosis of diffuse toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis was made systemic evaluation with infectious disease specialist cd4 count was uh, noted to be 47 and viral load of 22000 hepatitis b c uh, was negative mri uh, was normal except for uh, age related cortical atrophic changes and uh, systemic opportunistic infections were ruled out uh, for the ocular treatment, uh, intravitreal clindamycin 1 mg in 0.1 ml was given the same day and repeated after two weeks along with oral uh, antitoxoplasma consisting of Bactrim DS uh, two times a day for six weeks, clindamycin 300 mg four times a day for six weeks, highly active antiretroviral therapy was initiated and oral steroids was continued. So uh, at one month post treatment, there was dramatic improvement. The best corrected visual equity improved from 660 to 6 by 12. The anterior se uh, segment inflammation had subsided and the uh, retinitis patch had healed. So diffuse retinitis can be a manifestation of toxoplasma infection. Very careful history should be taken to roll out immunocompromised state, especially HIV infection. Serum ELISA and aqueous humor PCR can confirm diagnosis in case of uh, diagnostic dilemma and do not hesitate to revisit your diagnosis if there is no response to treatment. So my questions to panel, uh, in case of diffuse retinitis, when should you suspect toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis? Intraocular fluid testing, uh, PCR or goldman Whitmer coefficient or both, which is a better modality? And intravitreal clindamycin, we already answered a few questions. But in case of HIV, uh, whether uh, combining with intravitreal dexamethasone is an option. Thank you. I, I saw this case, and this patient presented such a diffuse retinitis and such a large patch of whole, almost whole of the retina was involved, almost whole of the retina. And there are specks of retina hemorrhages was there. So that made me think that probably we are dealing with a viral retinitis and uh, oral acyclovir, oral valcyclovir was inadequate. So I pushed uh, the patient to the intravenous uh, acyclovir, but there was no response. At that time, I thought that I will rule out syphilis and toxo and that ACTAP was initially, I didn't do the toxo. And then from the DNA, I did the toxo test and it came positive PCR as well as the serum toxoplasma IgG and IgG was positive. So this was not a previous experience. I didn't have any kind of such a, a huge retinitis uh, diffuse involving almost all of the retina. Um, so we, we went for HIV status at this stage and then HIV was uh, found to be positive. Patient did not disclose that. Congratulations, a very beautiful case and you saved the eye. So it was, was well, well done. It's very difficult because the, the differential diagnosis between talk show and viral disease is sometimes very, very difficult. Uh, about your questions, uh, the literature say that the, the ACTAP, the PCR, is worse than the Goodman-Whitmer uh, in the AC. So 
I don't have much experience, but the literature say this is, if you go to the vitreous, the PCR is very good, but they see the co coefficient would be better. Um, when you, you discovered that the patient was HIV, everything clear and, and, and change. So uh, the, 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 the good history is important. Yeah. I always talk to my, my uh, residents and fellows that uh, the patient very rarely uh, consider one history that he have with the eye problem. This is very usual in Bechet disease, for example. Nobody related the oral uh, 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 ulcer to the eye problem, so you have to ask. So uh, the blood transfusion was important 20 years ago. So it's very nice, very nice case, very difficult. Uh, there is a question from Ranju who's asking that if the titer from ocular fluid is 1.2 and serum is negative, would you still consider it positive? I would. I would consider positive. As for the intraocular fluid, if it is a positive, I will consider that positive. The thing about the serology is that in some patients, you have to test in undiluted serum. So yes. people stop testing in dilutions which show negative, but if you really go on diluting further, changing the dilution, you get to the point that you get a positive serology. So the finding of a positive test in the eye in a negative serology, you have to look at what level that serology was reported as negative, because it may be the cutoff was above what you need. I think the points that were made in the discussion, very important, the history, uh, patients really don't value other things, it's important to pressurize them to tell you more. Uh, uh, the, the issue about which test to do, normally if you have someone who's immunosuppressed, this patient usually will have more antigen in the eye than someone who is immunocompetent. So the PCR is, is many times better in, in the situation of immunosuppressed. When you have an immunocompetent individual, the coefficient, the coldman whitmer will be better. So in, in real terms, what people suggest is if you can, do both. You cover yeah. yourself very well by combining the two tests. That's the best way of doing that. Um, and, and one important message is, and it was done properly in there, once you see toxo in the eye of an HIV patient, it's essential to get brain imaging. Because if it's active in the eye, it can be active in the brain. And, and many times that's missed. So once you see, uh, when we looked at the HIV scenario years ago, toxo in the eye, reactivations of toxo in the eye were not common. We, we didn't see an explosion of more toxo in the eye. We saw toxo behaving differently, but not more. When it, what happened is once you have it in the eye, the brain has a lot more chance of having toxo than the eye because I, my, mm -hmm. my animal study showed that the, the, the brain harbors a lot more cysts in volume than the eye can have. So the chances are much greater. So toxo in the eye, HIV patient equals imaging of the brain to exclude the possibility of intracranial lesion. Dr. Carlos, there was another question related to what you just mentioned, that how important or essential it is to be doing a CT or MRI whenever we see an ocular toxo patient. I mean, would you do that as a routine for every patient in that you see? In an immunosuppressed individual, I would. In an immunocompetent individual, which is a very straightforward toxo case, behaving normally, I don't. I, I just go for patients who are heavily immunosuppressed, which is the case of HIV, but it could be something else that is immunosuppressing them because the risk of the brain is higher. Right, and there's another concern that, you know, would you really go ahead and use oral steroids in an immunosuppressed patient like what uh, uh, Dr. Nivedita just showed that the patient had HIV, would you be comfortable in using oral steroids in such a patient? Well, I think in this case, the patient was giving steroids because there was no knowledge of the HIV status and there was a, something else going on. I think that if you know someone is HIV, and they have an infectious process, we tend not to use steroids. We tend to use the antitoxo drugs to control the infection because the infection is out of control. The immune system is unable to hold it. So you tend not to give steroids. And then you wait because eventually the immune, if you recover from the immune status, then steroids may become again needed. But in general terms, it, it's the opposite from the thinking of the immunocompetent in which you think the steroid is the most important thing there. Here in the immunocompromised is the antitoxo drug that becomes really more important. Uh, this is normally how I do it. I'm not sure if the others have a different uh, way of, of tackling that, but I prefer really not to use steroids in, in the situations of uh, being very immunosuppressed.
what I what I do put your hand up. To, yeah, yes, yeah, to discuss with the infectious disease group because mm -hmm. they they usually are not concerned with the, the the steroids. They say go go ahead. They use a lot because of uh, uh, high intracranial pressure, so it would be yeah. okay. The CD4 counts on 47. You start on heart after that, so probably uh, with this amount of inflammation, the, the, the steroid would be needed. So yeah, the, the, I, I would discuss, discuss with the group, the infectious sure. disease group, they start on heart, say, oh, I, can, can I use steroids? And it, probably they say, yes, yeah, so I, I go for, for it. Usually a lot of them don't really show a lot of inflammation. You see the amount of retinitis in this patient and the amount of vitreous involvement was very, very little. Yeah. So you can see the need for the steroids is not exactly what you expect for the other cases we saw. So I tend to avoid, but you're right, we do use it. But normally if they're already showing signs of improvement, I don't tend to use like initially. I avoid mm -hmm. that, but okay. So we'll just go ahead with the last case presentation for today. And maybe, you know, if time permits, we'll take up some more questions. So we have uh, the uh, third case being presented by Dr. Sapia, and she's from PGI Chandigarh. Sabia, could you unmute yourself, please? Good evening, everyone. Uh, slide coming show. Yeah, please go ahead. Your slides are visible. Just do a screen show. Uh, yeah. Good evening, everyone. I'll be presenting a case of panuveitis in an elderly male. So our patient was a 75 years male. He came to us with complaint of diminution of vision in left eye since two weeks, which was gradually onset, painless and progressive. He was a known case of uh, diabetes mellitus and hypertension. On examination, a visual acuity in right eye was 612. However, in left eye, the patient was only perceiving light with accurate projection of rays. On anterior segment examination in the left eye, this was the presentation. The patient had congestion both conjunctival and circumconial. We can see that the patient had corneal edema and the, there were presence of desmet folds. Also, there were presence of granulomatous capes on the cornea as we can see here. And then the patient had the presence of a hypopion which was admixed with blood. Uh, we could not appreciate uh, anything in the posterior segment. There was presence of dense vitritis. So we went ahead with the left eye ultrasonography. The dense vitritis precluded the view of retina. So ultrasonography showed uh, mild vitritis with uh, uh, showed vitritis with presence of PVD, and no mass lesion could be appreciated on ultrasound. Based on this, we made a provisional diagnosis of left eye masquerade, keeping in view, uh, mind his age, that is 75 years, and left eye endogenous endophthalmitis and left eye idiopathic panuveitis. To, uh, we took the history of recent weight loss in view of masquerade syndrome and in view of endogenous end of endophthalmitis, we also took history of any recent hospital admission. However, he did not give any history. We admitted the patient and worked him up for endogenous end of blood cultures, urine cultures were sterile, MONTU was uh, not significant, Triple H was negative. And in order to search for any primary, we uh, went ahead with ultrasound abdomen, which was normal. Even CT chest and PET scan was normal. We also uh, went ahead with an aquastap and uh, no bacteria or fungal organisms were appreciated on the same and no malignant cells were seen. So as the infectious causes were ruled out, we decided to start the patient on oral steroids, 1 mg per kg. Under the cover of antibiotic, uh, we prescribed him ciprofloxacin 500 mg BD. And topicals were continued. At this time, at this point of time, we discharged the patient. He came to us after two weeks. And uh, by this time, his, his visual acuity had improved to counting finger 3 meter. And at this time, anterior segment inflammation had reduced, hypopion had cleared up. However, the presence of one plus cells was there. There was a clear, uh, vitritis had almost cleared up. However, at this time, we could appreciate a lesion, yellowish white lesion in the supratemporal quadrant. 
and there was presence of localized botrytis over this lesion. So we tried to pass a OCT scan through the lesion and on OCT we could appreciate that at the site of the lesion there was retinal thinning and retinal atrophy. However, the choroid appeared thickened at this site. So keeping in mind the clinical features and the OCT findings, we made a diagnosis of toxoplasma retinochoroiditis and decided to start him on trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole combination. Oral steroids were tapered. Serology was however not helpful. Both IgG and IgM were negative. So my uh, take home message should be that toxoplasma as we know can have diverse ocular presentation but ocular toxo presenting with severe panuveitis as in our case with severe vitreitis when no retinochoroidal lesion could be appreciated is quite rare and we should suspect a toxoplasmosis even in such patients. On searching literature, I could find this case in which the uh, in which sir has already discussed this case. The patient came to uh, clinic with a severe panuveitis. There was presence of hypopion like in our case and there was dense vitritis. So this patient underwent diagnostic vitrectomy and uh, on diagnostic vitrectomy after PCR, the patient was found to be positive for toxoplasma. However, in this case, no retinochoroidal lesion was appreciated. As we had given the patient uh, oral ciplofloxacin, oral ciplox might have has had some role on elim eliminating the toxoplasma parasite as it acts on the DNA gyrus as it was shown in a mice study. Thank you. I have seen one patient of uh, toxoplasmosis present with a diffuse anterior uveitis with mutton fat KPs all over the cornea and there is a so severe anterior chamber reaction, I couldn't see the fundus. When the KPs disappeared and the reaction uh, reduced, I could see that the macular area, there was a focal retinochoroiditis with uh, vitreous haze. So it's, it's not very unusual to have a anterior chamber reaction in the diffuse keratic precipitates and, uh, and the severe reactions, the, precluding the view of the fundus. Well, what I think is very unusual is that you described something that uh, Andre told you before he had seen only once before, which is a hypopion. And, and in your case, there was hypopion and there was blood as well. So that is, makes it a very unusual. That, that kind of picture, when I look at it, it makes me think of viral, makes me think of herpes, uh, anterior disease. That's what I see a uh, hypopion with, uh, with blood and all that. That's what I, I would think about. So for me, this is, I'm, 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 no, I'm, I'm always learning. You know, no matter how, how much you've seen, you always see something you've never seen before or you, you've heard about. I think this presentations and the paper you showed at the hypopion as well um, are, I would say, very unusual. Um, clearly, Andre has a vast experience in this with the number of talks that he sees. It is phenomenally higher than what I see. And he's only seen one from what he said to us. I had not seen one. I called him once about a patient I had and I couldn't even confirm that it was toxo. So this is, it's an interesting thing for us to know that it can happen. It's probably very rare, it can happen. Um, and it's just one extra thing to, to keep in mind. But yeah, very, I'm not, Andre, you, you wanna comment on that? Oh, it's, it's, it's rare, it's extremely rare. And then I agree with you, with blood, it's, it's, I, I never seen. Uh, but I agree with Professor Bichos, it's quite common to have a uh, huge amount of inflammation in the interior segment in Toxo. And sometimes you can see the fundus. What I tend to do here is to treat the anterior segment, to try to clear a little bit and bring the patient again in a couple of days. Uh, because we are trying to give you different medication. And in Brazil specifically, is very uh, a danger because most of the people say, oh, this is toxo because it's very common. So they can't see the fundus and start on Bactrin plus steroids. And it's not, not uncommon to see later on that what 
viral and the, the patient's blind. So we have to take care. I would go for the treatment of the anterior segment and then to try to see the fundus to have a clue to make the diagnosis of toxo. So there is a question being raised that could this be a case of post-op endophthalmitis? The patient was faking. Oh, I think same. The, uh, Sabina told about this case. Same thing happened in our case also. So uh, it's a very, I believe, it's a very uh, extremely rare case, case uh, scenario. And we also investigated our patient for androgenous endophthalmitis. The patient presented with hypopian. And uh, when we extensively investigated and uh, uh, the vitreous biopsy we did, in this patient and the vitreous biopsy was negative for all the genome and suddenly we just thought of doing a toxo because uh, in routine investigation the toxo titer was raised in our case so the vitreous biopsy was positive for toxo so then only we decided to level it as a case of toxo uh, toxo so i my take on such presentation is yes i do agree that it's a very very rare case scenario yeah. but if you if you remember that there are some experimental study that delayed type of hypersensitivity which uh, has been observed in both human and animal after uh, they injected the toxoplasmin which was made up of the antigens from the tachyzoids so similarly the immunomodulatory properties of the tachyzoids lysate antigen which is which they called uh, which they uh, exhibited that there is a strong immune stimulatory properties both in vivo or vitro and uh, it can present some some kind of allergic reactions also so there may be possibility some immune mediated mechanism involved in such cases which we don't know so since there's always a doubt to the serology report that we get, I mean, how often do you really go ahead and treat a patient based on your clinical judgment where all both IgG and IgM are going to be negative? I mean, how often have you really seen such type of cases? Well, the clinical judgment depends on, our, on what, how much you can see in the eye. So the difficulty you have in some of these patients is that you're dealing with an anterior disease, for instance, this example we just had now. You didn't have any view of the back of the eye. So your, your, your clinical judgment is not complete because you couldn't complete your examination and, and it becomes difficult. So um, then, then it becomes hard to use your clinical judgment to make a decision. I think uh, uh, getting a B scan to assess how much is going on in the back, is there a lot of vitritis, is there anything you can see to, that might help you is useful to do. Uh, but clearly, without seeing the back of the eye, you, you're going to be very uh, hard pressed. I think if you have to do something, uh, Andrea was mentioning there in Brazil, people will use toxo treatment because it's the most common, but sometimes you're surprised and it's a viral. I have seen many times patients receiving combination cover for everything because you are worried about the fact that you're, you're losing vision and you want to treat this patient. So I'm covering everything just to be wow. safe. And, and because I can't see the back of the eye, I, I don't know what's in there. It may be that once it's all clear, there'll be very little happening there. But on the other hand, if I have a B scan showing the vitreous is involved, it's likely to be something happening in that retina that is responsible for that. So uh, if, if I have seen patients treated for both conditions at the same time, added everything, antiviral and antitoxo, uh, treatment because we wanted to give something to the patient and wanted to control inflammation, but did not want to run risks with uh, with missing something. So it's not the ideal scenario, but you're not dealing with an ideal situation of examination anyway. It makes life difficult. There's no doubt about that. Dr. Vishali, you wanted to ask No, no, I agree. There is and one question, uh, Manisha from Dahlia. Have you seen that? Ma'am, I'm just trying to take up whatever questions I can. It uh, says in a patient, this is Andrew for you probably, patient mm -hmm. underwent treatment for bilateral multifocal retinocoroditis 10 years back with antitoxoidin for more than one year. And since last 10 years, patient has had five relapses. What is the recommendation if she wants to get pregnant? To get Who's pregnant, yes. no. if, if she has only the, the ocular... Uh, uh, IgG, also. IgM are negative, but five recurrences in 10 years after I, one year of treatment. IgG and IgM negatives? Yes. 
So maybe it's not toxo. Yeah, yeah. Probably I would repeat this this uh, 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 lab tests because maybe having immunosuppression because it is multifocal retinochoroniditis. Yes. Because we would expect to have an IgG positive and an IgM negative. Mm -hmm. So I would yeah. review this diagnosis. Uh, yeah. It's difficult. I think when you, if you have a clinical presentation which is unusual, so a multifocal choroiditis, which is a multifocal lesions in both eyes, in the negative toxo, so you're creating a scenario that tells you probably this is not toxo, it's something else. And, and I, would, I would kind of feel, okay, well, let, let's find out what it is. But it's looking less and less like toxo. There is a question only for Carlos, which says, could you please describe the manifestations of outer retinal toxoplasmosis? It's kind of related. Of what, sorry, the retinal? Outer retinal. Outer, outer retinal. What happens with outer retinal is usually an early stage that tends to progress to a full thickness disease. It's unusual that the outer toxo remains outer completely. That you might be able to see patients in which you see the lesions and there's no vitritis because it's happening very deep in the retina and the vitreous is clear. But if you give time and you follow that patient, if you see that the, inf the inflammation will become more progressively more in the retina as well and they tend to have more of a full thickness lesion so it, it is a manifestation which may be an early stage of a, of a lesion developing uh, and, and many times it is the, the biggest component is outer retinal rather than the rest so it may be that the, the cysts are mostly more inner retinal most of the cysts you see in, in sections are not deep they're more inner and uh, so most of the cases we see are going to be you know full thickness from the start but there are situations when the lesions can be can start off as a deeper lesion with a tendency to become more full thickness uh, and, and create more of a, a normal uh, presentation. But it's very uncommon as well. I would say the outer retinal uh, puntate cases are, are unusual cases, for me at least. Uh, we, we're dealing with UK now. I've been here 30 years. So my experience in the past 30 years has been more what I see in the UK. And here, we don't see this very commonly. I think places where it's much more prevalent, like in Brazil, Andre probably sees more, maybe you guys in India see more, and you may see this presentation more frequently. I, I very rarely see it. So Carlos, do you think lesions uh, are associated with more of the, uh, you know, the subneurosensory fluid? And uh, I've been referred cases uh, like these where the primary ophthalmologist have diagnosed them as CSR, and actually they oh. actually come out yeah. to be toxo. Well, that case, I showed the example in my presentation. You could see there was no vitritis and a huge serous attachment. Right. So that is because it's the outer retina is more involved. But if you look at that lesion over time, that, that thickness of the, the retina became a full thickness retina. So we right. started off there. It causes a lot of choroidal involvement, a lot of RPE disturbance. Fluid comes through and it looks like quiet vitreous and all that happening. But it is what, yes, you can see that happening. That's the case I showed you before in, in my presentation. Absolutely, I agree. Because well, OCT I, will help in such situation. OCT will help. Yes. To distinguish CSR and retinochoroiditis. I have two questions related to the use of Ozodex. So we have a situation where you have a healed patch of retinochoroiditis. There's absolutely no activity. And the patient, they're intolerant to oral steroids, but they keep coming back with recurrent attacks of vitritis. So in such a situation, how are you going to really go about managing because they really can't take up oral steroids? So would it be safe to use uh, oral, uh, I mean, uh, Ozodex in such a situation? I, I feel very worried about using anything that is depo in toxoplasmosis. Now, I, I, Andre was describing what happened in, in, the, in the study they've done. I personally have seen disasters happening following depo injections. So I feel very, very worried. I, I don't do it. I think dexamethasone is as bold as I get when it comes to talking, uh, treating toxo locally. Um, I, I would certainly run away from this. I think there was another question, Manisha, related to dexamethasone. Yes. Half-life is very short. Yes. And you give it for one week. How do you explain that? Actually, that's a concern with most of us because if we are giving a local therapy, we are not giving oral steroids. And we know the half-life is too short of dexamethasone to be giving a coverage for one week. 
So are we under treating to control the inflammation? Well, you, you have to see how the lesion is responding. Um, I, I think uh, most of us who have used local therapy uh, uh, see that the, the need for uh, repeated injections is mostly on a weekly basis. Uh, I would imagine, like in virus, I said before, I do inject more if necessary. Uh, maybe there's no reason why you could not give a second injection if you find that the response is not going as quickly as you expected and you're certain it is toxic, then you will be able to offer a bit more. Dexamethasone is very short half-life, definitely will disappear within a very short time. Uh, but the clinical experience, at least in the papers I've read and the cases I've treated, I, I haven't come across a patient that I had to go ahead and inject more frequently. Um, by far, my treatments have been on a weekly basis rather than saying I started too weekly. Maybe in one case, I think we may have done the, the first week even two injections, uh, but I, that, I don't remember if I, I don't remember that case very well, but mostly I would say no, I would do just once a week. Um, I'm not sure the others now. I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that the people do differently and I, I can learn from that. Dr. Biswas, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, I, I just sometimes prefer to give a, a, a twice a week because this, the lesions is active. I will prefer to give twice a week. Okay. Uh, but that is not usual. That's not your usual regime. You probably no, do no. most of the cases once a week and occasionally you do twice a week. Uh, I have another question that do we repeat the serum IgG, IgM while treating these cases to monitor the duration of treatment or the decision is entirely clinical? In my hands, totally clinical. I, I don't use that. I don't bother to check anything else. I also don't repeat toxoplasma title. Yeah. There was a question by Dr. Maria that, you know, in acquired toxoplasma, would you prefer to do the fundus examination three months after the IgM has come positive? Andre, I think that's over to you. So I, I, I think it's only if the study, so you, you, you has to do to follow a study or if patient present with any complaints, because otherwise you know that around 10% of the patients will present primary uh, ocular toxins, so it's not pointing seeing uh, 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 all the patients without any uh, with symptoms. any comp yeah. yeah there have to be symptoms I have a question from Dr. Kumar Sami that would there be a special situation where you would prefer a quadruple therapy and when would you suggest that four drugs a quadruple therapy yeah. do you give it any more no I combine clindamycin with azithromycin many of the times. And there is also a question, uh, uh, Carlos, duration of azithromycin therapy by Dr. Shetty. I, I use azithromycin for the duration of the normal course of treatment. If you read about azithromycin, it should, it, the, 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 what it says, you should use it for three days only, not in toxo. So I use it for the four, six weeks that I'm needing it. I will use it for the four, six weeks. So it's, uh, the, the regime will follow the same protocol that I use with the other drugs, uh, but using azithromycin instead. So it's not a shorter course, it is a, a normal prolonged course according to your clinical manifestation, yeah. I'll just take up a last question from Dr. Andre. You talked about prophylaxis. So how do you really monitor your patients? Are there any specific parameters and what is your follow-up schedule for such patients? Yeah, the, the, the first thing is which patient will you go for uh, prophylaxis? So since you start the prophylaxis, I'll see the patient every three months. And any and one year. parameters? No, and, then, and then I stop the therapy and give some orientation to the patient and see whatever he feels come to the clinic after one year. During the prophylaxis, I'll see every three months. Any fast test for toxo? That's the last question. I don't think we have. Sorry? Clinical judgment, isn't it? What is that, Vishali? I missed your question. 
any fast test, quick test? Can you do any quick lab test for Toxo? I think the majority of the times, it is what you see in the eye that makes the diagnosis for you. If you are stuck, I don't think there is a quick test. I think there is a, clearly you can ask you for serology or get your eye samples, but I don't think there's anything that will give you the answer in 24 hours. You know, I think it's, it's not going to happen that way. I think fundus examination is the quickest test. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, exactly. Clinically, I suspect Toxo. I start uh, Toxo without uh, uh, yeah. the laboratory test results coming. I start yeah. the treatment. And there is a question from Ravendra Mali. Uh, Manisha, have, can I read that? How do you treat patients who are steroid responders, multiple recurrent vitreous haze? What would you use if you cannot use steroids? And there is hazy vitreous. Well, it is about steroid responder in the sense of pressure. Is that what we're talking about? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, the majority of the patients, unless there's a contraindication for systemic, will be receiving systemic anyway. And, and the steroid response in these patients is less of an issue. Uh, it's going to be a problem if you need to inject intraocular steroids. But if you're giving dexamethasone, I wouldn't worry too much. I think my, the, the concern you have with steroid responders is depot again, is the problem of getting something which has a prolonged action. I wouldn't worry too much if I'm using dexamethasone. I would treat, you know, I wouldn't worry about the pressure problem. I would just clear the vitreous if it is not responding. Yeah. yeah. I would just treat, yeah. So when you have a patient like uh, having recurrent attacks of vitritis, how would you be sure that it's just inflammation or there's a reactivation of your disease process? No, I said if it's not responding and I do not have, I just do the therapeutic as well as on the diagnostic side, you can be very sure what you're doing. Right. So thank you so much. I think we've had a very interesting discussion on various aspects of ocular toxoplasmosis. And talk, a special thanks to Dr. Carlos and Dr. Andre for having taken out their valuable time in such difficult situation that we all are facing right now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ale, Dr. Partho, and uh, Dr. Biswas again for joining in. And thank you to all the case presenters. I think they were very interesting cases and added a lot to our discussion today. So thank stay you all. healthy. Thank you very thank much. You. Pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Have a great weekend, all of you. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.